Good day chaps. So today's video is on the Praying Mantis, one of the more unusual vehicles from World War II. This video is in two parts. I will chat about its background and design a bit, and the other half of the video will be covering the two prototypes in testing. The Praying Mantis was an attempt to create a vehicle or weapons carrier able to engage opponents in built up or difficult terrain by means of an elevating body to give a line of sight over obstructions otherwise not possible. But how did this vehicle come to be? The design was first patented by Mr. Ernest James Tapp, who first filed the patent in August of 1937. In the design, he envisioned a low-profile machine to carry one or more persons in a prone position which would be able to raise itself to engage targets with a machine gun. Mr. Tapp was born in 1891 and had been a survivor of the First World War, serving as a second lieutenant in the machine gun corps and had experienced the difficulties of fighting from the trenches and witnessed the weakness of tanks being engaged while exposed in the open from defilated positions and the subsequent massacre of the infantry as they tried to retreat. Mr. Tapp believed that what was required was a tracked vehicle with a very low profile and a high speed, but before he could do anything the war came to an end. Post-war, he and his brother Percy Tapp set up County Commercial Cars Limited in 1929, converting American twin-axle trucks to three-axle vehicles via a new system he designed. He also filed other patents in his time, such as roller coaster wheels, and was one of the two men that invented the modern garbage truck you see around today. Post-war, the firm was involved in the design of tractors, often distinguished by the large use of oversized front wheels until it went bust in the 1990s. With growing unrest in Europe and Hitler's rise to power, Ernest Tapp began to dust off these old ideas, and while many knew another war was almost inevitable, how it would be fought was still uncertain. With some believing that it would devolve into a trench-like stalemate, while others felt that it would be a war of mechanised mobility. With this in his thoughts, Tapp was able to meet up with tank designers who had experienced these situations, such as Swindon and Martel, and began to design a vehicle able to counter the experiences he'd seen in World War I. In August 1937, he submitted the initial plans and filed the patent for a new design for a mechanically propelled armoured vehicle for the transport of personnel, supplies or ammunition, to be operated with greater concealment than was possible for a normal military vehicle, which would enable natural or artificial obstacles to be negotiated, and furthermore allow the control of the vehicle to be effected without impairing the manipulation of its weapons by the occupants. An initial series of three wooden mock-ups were made, showing the vehicle in each stage from its low prone position to the extended position, and from this the first prototype began construction in 1938 and was ready for demonstration in 1939 under the guidance of General Paget and was sent up to Chobham. This first machine differed quite radically. The suspension was primarily from parts made at their factory, and while displaying the distinctive low profile of the later model, the gun module was not external, but attached to the top of the lifting arm and featured a broader faceplate able to swivel between 37 and 38 degrees either side. Although the initial plans only showed a single gun, two were fitted on the first prototype. This system was fitted with various sighting devices and had a large counterweight at the back to offset the front weight. The vehicle was able to operate in very low prone position of just 33 inches high, or 83 centimetres, and if required, extend its full height to 130 inches or 3.81 meters. It had been envisioned in the plans that the whole raised arm would be traversable, but this appears to have been stopped, possibly due to severe balance issues. The proof of concept testbed was made using primarily parts from the motor firm itself on a framed mount and had four small road wheels and a large rear drive sprocket attached to a small 30 or 40 horsepower Ford four cylinder engine mounted to the rear. The idea had some novel features, notably that in order to fit inside the low profile the driver lay prone. Because of this and the fear that the Germans would use gas, of which Mr. Tapp would have had experience in the trenches, and the fact that the occupant was not able to wear a gas mask inside, he modified the system that blew cool air in from the rear fan to overpressurize the crew compartment and to prevent the air from simply blowing out the gaps, fine brush-like filters were added. This also doubled up to help keep the driver cool while trapped in a large metal box. He also added a simple pulley system that could manipulate and operate the lifting arm in the event of an engine failure. While the machine's low profile was considered to be very successful, several areas of concern were raised. 
The first was its inability to clear any obstructing obstacles when at full height. Concerns around the gun's recoil pressures were raised, reloading, and around the one-man crew. Thus, he was asked to take these into account for any finalised design. Mr. Tapp was able to redraw the plans to the new specification in December 1939, and these plans were sent over to the War Office for approval, as the UK was now at war with Germany. The project was then transferred to the Ministry of Supply, who promptly halted all work on the project on the 22nd of January 1940, as they felt all efforts should go into the production of regular tanks, and that low-priority machines were a resource they could ill afford, despite having a plethora of other such projects on the go. The idea was picked up again in October 1941, when the Minister of Supply asked for Mr Tapp's idea to be available for demonstration, along with inspections from Generals Martel and Richardson, and those from the Department of the Tank Design. Although due to the Minister of Supply previously cancelling the order, no further work had been done on the two-man version, which they had been expecting. Nevertheless, in May 1942, a contract was signed for the production of two further machines to be built for evaluation, and private trials were carried out in July 1943, which highlighted a few faults around the gun mount, which was reworked into a new system. The next trials were undertaken at Chobham in October 1943, but Mr Tapp had begun to grow frustrated as not only was the machine he felt not ready, but the crew had not been sufficiently trained to operate the machine. Around this stage a device was fitted between the guns to act as a grapple hook to push or pull away any obstructing branches. This second machine differed from the first. It was now built on a modified universal carrier with three road wheels per side. The engine remained the same as the carriers, but the lifting arm was now somewhat thinner and broader to allow two men to lie side by side. The mechanism to control the raising and lowering of the device was done by the feet via push pedals and the driver on the right and the gunner to the left. The guns, consisting of a pair of Bren guns rotated 180 degrees, were now in an independent external housing mounted above the driver, able to traverse 30 degrees up and down and with 360 degrees of rotation for the gun housing. The overpressure system was still there, but now only for cooling purposes, and the two large visored shutters on the front were for observation. The rear decks had a louvered hunchback type of cowl to protect the engine, with the main arms being supported on twin booms, with the armoured compartment located between the two. For access, a large double door was fitted over the back of the fighting compartment, although it was still reportedly difficult to get in and out of. The vehicle itself was robust enough, however the drivers complained of motion sickness while driving the machine in its prone position, due to the jolts and rocking motion, which caused the eye level to be either on the ground or in the sky, but rarely level and flat. It was during these trials that General Richardson stated that the assembly looked like a praying mantis rising itself to strike, and the name struck, and became the official designation for the system. The vehicle underwent some 435 miles of cross-country tests until December 1943, when the Ministry of Supply once again ordered work to be stopped on the machine. The vehicle was sent back to County Commercial where Mr Tapp, who was serving now in the Home Guard, was able to make the improvements he felt were needed. The Ministry of Supply again wrote to Mr Tapp that year, saying there was no need at the time for such a machine, but that it should be held in readiness should a situation arise. Mr Tapp improved upon the vehicle more at home, and though he was denied further firing trials, as part of the Home Guard unit he was able to gain permission to test it locally. Not much further action was taken. The question was raised in June 1944 for the production of 12 machines to be used in the Middle East, but this didn't gain traction, and on the 31st of July 1944, the General Staff wrote to inform him there would be no further requiring for the Praying Mantis, and the vehicle was to be no longer considered for further evaluation. The Praying Mantis remains a unique idea at just the wrong time and place. Its primary faults were that it could not mount any weapon with a heavier recoil than light machine guns, and the war being fought was very different from which it had been envisioned for. Ironically, at around the same time it was being cancelled, vast improvements in hollow charge weapons and rockets were coming into play, which would have been ideally suitable. While the vehicle designed by Mr Tapp was placed into obscurity, the idea didn't fade, and periodically a requirement for a mast-mounted weapon system has arisen, particularly in the Cold War, where several designs got to the same stage of testing and evaluation stages, albeit with anti-tank guided missiles now, and not machine guns. 
And so while his design might not have been suitable for the previous war, its legacy was indeed that of a future war. Before we proceed to the video section, I'd like to thank Mr. Toby Rickards, Mr. Tapp's great-grandson, for permission to use the footage included. So with that said, enjoy.
Well, guys, that's all we've got time for today. I hope you enjoyed that or learned something new. If so, give us a like and subscribe below. And until next time, toodle pip.